Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Where do we find you today? Is that the Library of Alexandria? What is that? <laughs> That's actually a uh, library in Hungary between uh, Vienna and Budapest that uh, is the most gorgeous library I've ever seen. It's actually in a monastery. Wow. I was going to say, if that's your house, then uh, you've done quite well uh, on the uh, partnership with BlackRock. Yes. So many leather bound books. Um, all right, man, we, um, we're we going to get into your new book, which uh, Transparent Investing, which is out on Amazon and everywhere books are sold, um, which uh, I loved. But first, we got to get a little background because you made a few stops, did a cool, few cool things. Um, the, the listeners will uh, be familiar with first, first of which, well, I shouldn't say first, because you started out at an oil company, right? I was going to say Morningstar, yeah. but you did a little yeah. stop before that, right? Out of yeah. university? Uh, yeah, I, I worked for uh, uh, Amico, which is now part of BP. But then uh, how does so how does a guy working at a oil in the oil patch hop over to Morningstar? So they actually reached out to me, I was uh, actually planning on getting a PhD in finance. And a friend of mine uh, connected me with their head of HR. And I even kind of helped them look at what a research function would be and said, you know, I'm not an econometrician. I may not be the right person. And they were like, no, no, no. You, it's, it's, it, it's just something we want to uh, get started. And so um, just happened to be a, a, a great fit and uh, shift going from that kind of corporate finance thing over to the investment world. Where, where was Morningstar? Uh, Morningstar sort of was at about 300 employees when I joined, and I think they were at about 400 when I left. So um, I was the, hired as the head of research and focused on uh, performance measurement, did a lot of work on their after-tax stuff, which they'd already been developing, but um, jumped into that. And that was actually the interesting tie to the, the oil company, because when I moved over to the investment space, I was sort of baffled at why aren't people doing risk-adjusted after-tax cash flows? That's real money. That's real dollars. And for taxable investors, that's the only cash flow and risk that matters. Why aren't we doing it that way? Long story for why that's the case. Um, then uh, moved over to being the, the, their first CFO. You know, the uh, there's a simple answer on why no one cared about it because it's not the sexy part. Taxes yeah. don't sell, as you know. Um, yeah. Well, they do. You just got to get the right crowd. But certainly- yep. When you're writing a magazine article, it's hard to talk about it. Um, and so how much of that was driven, you know, your time there by your interests and kind of where you led down the path versus kind of what they were doing at the time? The research was very much to, to, to flesh out their um, their analytic capabilities and, and their number crunching. And I, there were not grand things I wanted to do. I wasn't allowed to. Um, so, I mean, it was a good place to work. And, and um, no, it was really just developing that, that capability. So when I started, I was the only official part of research. And when I left, it was uh, a group of like five. So it was just building that out, obviously much, much bigger now. So you had your hands dirty with some of the research, what was going on with that part of the world. And you said, you know what? Something's amiss. I see an opportunity. There's a, there's a, a point where I could go start a new company. What, what was the origin story there? So uh, I'd moved back to California where I'm from in 97 and I was uh, uh, teaching portfolio theory at the uh, University of California, Berkeley's extension program. And uh, I also had a small <laughs> emphasis on small consulting practice on the side. And my co-founder at Perio, Paul Soli, He's got really good radar for spotting odd skill sets. And he looked, a, a client of his asked, should I take this course? And showed him the, uh, the listing in the catalog. And he thought, what's the former head of research at Morningstar doing with his own, like something's weird here. I got to meet this guy. So we, we connected and kept talking about what we could offer. And over the course of about a year, uh, we actually never formally decided to start a company. It was just every conversation went further and further. Um, and then in the summer of 90, uh, 99, we finally officially filed for the, the company and, and uh, got started. Yeah. And what was the uh, origin story mission at the time? I mean, we were both um, very clearly way over in the indexing camp. And we looked at things like, well, 
there are already some great players here. Like if we can't offer something more than they do, like a, like a Vanguard or others, um, why bother? And that's where we got into the, 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 the tax side and then the customization, and there was tax loss harvesting already existed, but we uh, we focused on offering a very customized version of indexing with both the tax side and really building it around uh, a client's particular portfolio of their risk issues, their their environmental social governance. So it was an opportunity narrowed by what was already available and what wasn't. And it was the customization that we saw the, the part that really wasn't there. So um, this feels like a very 2022 conversation, but you were doing it 25 years ago um, with two really big topics that are still, um, you know, making their way through our industry, the customization and, and sort of, um, and, and I lump ESG in there. And then yep. also the tax side Yep. in the early days, um, what was the like leading um, pitch or what resonated with yeah. the end investor? And, and were you focusing just on uh, professionals or was it direct to retail? And, and which one of those two really like was, we, was we the tried. thing wanted? We tried. We thought, in fact, it's funny. It was a bit parallel Morningstar where when, when Joe Mansueto started, he thought it was going to be investors paying for it. And then suddenly found that advisors, wealth managers had a huge need that was not being fulfilled. Similarly, we thought we would be managing money directly for clients and very quickly learned it's kind of too arcane and complicated a thing to explain. And what are you going to do, direct advertising for this? So uh, almost immediately, we ended up working through intermediaries, basically the higher end um, uh, wealth managers. And the initial sales push was really on the tax side and it was still fairly new there most people hadn't really heard of it um some some had uh, nothing like today and um and then it's funny the early uh sales discussions would at that time was more indexing versus active and then as things started evolving it was more like oh why you why this custom version versus a straight ETF or, or indexed mutual fund. And then once people really had heard of this kind of customized uh, indexing strategy, then it boiled down to, okay, how are you different from your competitors? So it was really interesting to watch that evolution from clients who were quite unfamiliar with the concept to, uh, you know, within the last few years, it's, it's one of the hottest spaces in the investment industry. You know, and this is obviously a huge success today, 40 plus billion dollar um, firm. What was the on-ramp like? Was this something where it was like, boom, immediate product market fit? Or was no. this like a overnight success, you know, 20 years in the making? Uh, no, it was, it was, it was slow. It took, uh, it took four or five years to really get some traction say in 2003 people would ask me hey how's your business going and my answer was <laughs> well we're too much of a success to be labeled a failure but we're, we're too much of a failure to be labeled a success it was limping along um we we all were uh had side jobs i mean we did this with no capital ours or anybody else's and so it took a while to get the traction it and it started looking like it was going to be a real business around 2004 had had uh, some big institutional clients that really fortuitously arrived and then coming out of the the meltdown in 0809 that's when we saw the real traction i think at the end of 2011 we were like 2 billion and then grew that to 42 billion by the end of uh of uh 2020 so nine years went what's that 21 fold and a lot of that was writing the the flows into indexing in general i mean we were a big part of that and benefited enormously and then as people started figuring out the other angles the esg the tax side even the factor side in a way we were had some foresight and in another way we were just fortunate to be standing in the right place Right place, right time. Well, yep. you know, we often say the best uh, compliment you can give, uh, this applies to investors too, but entrepreneurs is that you just survive, right? Yep. So, yep. so many go out of business. So the fact yeah. you're still around yep. is, is a compliment already. Yep. Okay. So 
Um, what what about the financial crisis? Do you think um, drove that point home for investors that they wanted a solution like this? I mean, do you I, think it? I, just- I think they they woke up to they were being pitched a lot of stuff that didn't pan out, and the research data like that was nothing new. That's been around for decades. Something in the market and the tight guys was ready for a lot of investors moving on to to indexing, understanding the fee side and how much that mattered. And I think it was a kind of bitterness that the 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 dot com blow up was more sort of industry specific. And though the the home mortgages were t- uh, technically the catalyst for the 0809 meltdown, that was so broad that a lot of strategies, especially on the hedge fund side that were supposed to protect market downturns, those blew up and they actually didn't have the downside protection they were promising. And this kind of cynicism came in uh, uh, among consumers that I think is a very positive thing. Just they finally woke up and smelled the coffee. Yeah, you know, I think um, echoing that, I think when you have especially times of crisis where things don't work out and investors um, in many cases are, are pitched or sold something that often doesn't have either a long track record or it's just a different market regime or environment. You know, a lot of strategies that did okay from 2000, 2003, then got um, pummeled in, in yep. 08. Yep. But, but often, you know, what we talk a lot about is um, that's often a one way um, road like the people don't ever go back and and i say this with kind of the high price active world too like no one goes back to paying two percent for an s p closet indexing fund you know once they've sold it they're never they're never going back yeah yeah um so at least you hopefully have this directional area of progress but often it takes those painful um disruptions to make it happen it feels like i'm not sure yeah um Okay, so walk through, you guys are growing, getting big, and then eventually you say, you know what, um, we're going to partner up with uh, uh, BlackRock. Depending on your perspective, you could call them the Darth Vader. You call yep. them the Darth Vader, you could call them the Yoda. I don't know who yep. they are in the Star Wars <laughs> ecosystem, but they're the big one. Um, yep. What was the decision there? And then uh, what? where are we in the timeline? What year would this have been? So the discussions with them started late in 2020. And we had sold a majority stake in 2018 to a private equity firm. Why? Basically demographics. My co-founder and I were, you know, heading into getting near to retirement age. And so uh, that was the, the catalyst to, to create some liquidity. And then the, the private equity firm had said, look, we're, we're fairly long-term. We're not, we're not looking to flip this. And then reality hit where suddenly everybody had to own one of these things. It was just the, the, the big players all went nuts. You can still see this playing out, um, uh, say, with the UBS acquisition of Wellfront, that just everybody had to have some sort of custom indexing, tax loss harvesting. Um, and so BlackRock was a great fit. So we weren't making the call as to whether to to be part of a bigger firm, but BlackRock was a great fit because, I mean, these are the folks who invented indexing. If you go back to 1971 and the uh, old uh, Wells Fargo, which then became uh, Barclays Barclays Global and then uh, that BlackRock acquired. So this is the home of indexing. And that philosophical fit was was terrific that we weren't going to be getting in a lot of arguments about why would you do this indexing thing? It makes less revenue. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you said, you know what? I'm tired of surfing and hiking in uh, the Bay Area. Or, or uh, what, what, what do all my friends up there do? Kite surfing, uh, cycling, active golf. Who knows what it is? Making cheese and wine, um, beer. Uh, you said, I'm going to write a book. Was this a pandemic-induced idea or what? Were you just like stuck no, in fact, like I'm going to torture myself and write no, a book? No, no, and the, <laughs> that's that's well put. Why why torture yourself? It was a commitment I made a long time ago, probably around 
2010, when I was just looking at the good fortune of what was happening at Perio, and I made a kind of commitment to the universe of, all right, look, I need to do a major payback if, if you know, we hit a certain level of, of success. And, and we blew right through that level. And I was in arrears for many years and finally got tired of that uh, hanging on my shoulder. And uh, the pandemic timing is, is purely coincidental. I actually flew to the East Coast and met with the editor I ended up using great independent shop um, in January of 2020. So I was already on the path when the pandemic hit. It was convenient in the sense of if you're going to work that hard to do a book when you're working full time, you don't want a lot of other distractions. And as everybody knows, like a lot of those fun distractions in life uh, disappeared for quite a while. And so uh, I was still working full time through uh, less than a year, through about May of uh, 2021, and then just did the book on the side. I would get up early and, and work weekends, and and uh, producing, and then of course promoting it as a huge amount of work on top of that. I like the book, you know, um, for the biggest reason being is that you. Um, I shouldn't say have no filter, but you clearly speak your mind, um, which, uh, you know, part, you, part of you but, would not look, be the first person to accuse me of not having the, the kind of uh, filter and niceties we all need, you know, but I, I often think in our industry, you know, if we were to hook someone up to a, you know, like lie detector as they're saying certain things and watch kind of like it squiggle as they're talking. Yeah. So to try to distinguish how much do they believe at their core and how much of this is you know, their narrative and marketing yep. And, yep. and how much of it is muddled. But yeah. um, the challenge in our world, of course, is uh, a lot of it falls in the middle. But, um, but you, you know, your book clearly shines through in that way, which I think is great. So uh, tell me the inspiration. Um, you know, you said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to birth this book. What was really the message that you think um, kind of you wanted to convey? What's the soul of this book? So it was first and foremost, a uh, consumer advocacy, uh, educational aim. I, I want consumers to wake up to the, the BS they get fed by the industry. And I, I actually became more tolerant or compassionate, maybe not the right word, of the industry as I was writing it, realizing, you know, there's still a lot of value there. There's still a lot of situations where clients may be told, oh, just do this yourself, it's simple. And they balk at the, what? Um, the, the challenge of, in, in writing the book is another book on investing, another book on just buy index funds? Like who needs that? There, there are dozens and dozens of, of good ones. There are, the, the two pieces I thought were missing, I'd not seen anyone blend all the research in behavioral finance with all the research on how, what an atrocious track record, active um, management, uh, both security selection and the asset allocation, market time and, and market beating behavior. They, mm -hmm. They're just, they're awful. They're not like a little thin. It's, it's so overwhelming. So that piece was fairly clear and within the pro indexing camp, well understood. The piece I hadn't seen was the brain is such an important component and the way it's evolved and the way in which it's actually very inefficient in terms of making poor decisions because we're wired through evolution for a world that existed, whatever, older Homo sapiens, three, 400,000 years, that for survival on the, the plains of Central Africa, yeah, that, that's great. The modern investment world, no, we actually do some unhealthy things. So it was blending those two with a an advocacy piece but also saying how do you help people decide whether to do it themselves or hire somebody and i'd never seen anything helpful that i thought was um, unbiased because the recommendations on that either come from the industry big guess there quick question there what are they going to pick hiring someone or or uh telling people to do it themselves or a kind of cynical it's all snake oil salespeople. It's like, you can't trust it. You got to do it on your own. I thought, boy, that doesn't address those people kind of caught in the middle. And so one of the big um, components of the book that I think is new is this idea of how do you figure out 
whether or not to hire someone or not and really distill it down to what services are you buying? And that's when I tried to emphasize what I'd seen in my 30 years in the industry is I actually think most clients as investors aren't very clear about why they're hiring a manager. Are they doing it to try and beat the market? Are they doing it to help their financial planning? And what was um, uh, one of the more interesting parts about the book is really sifting that out. And I hadn't even done that for myself and finding, you know, there's a long list of areas where the industry does add value. And there are some really serious um, incentive problems around its predictive abilities. And as I was uh, putting that in the book, and in fact, it, it's a story in the book, and I even have a, 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 a animated video I did on this. I thought of the scene from The Wizard of Oz. Okay, where does The Wizard of Oz gonna be a good analogy for investing? What's up with that? It's that climax scene when Toto pulls the curtain back and they figure out that the wizard's a fraud. And Dorothy marches over to him with great indignation and says, you're a very bad man. Hmm. And the wizard, the fake wizard answers, no, I'm a very good man. I'm just a bad wizard. And I'm hmm. like, Bingo. That's the analogy that works for investment advisors. When investment advisors pretend they're a wizard with a crystal ball, which that character had when he was in, back in Kansas, that's lying. It's lying because they imply an ability that's just absolutely not there. The investment industry has an awful track record at predicting which stocks are going to outperform or whether the stock market's going up or down. And so he then helps those three characters, the Tin Man, Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion, but he's more of a kind of a counselor and uh, maybe a life coach, therapist. He, he gives them something they need. They, they come out much uh, richer or, or, or they benefit greatly, not in a financial sense, from that interaction once he stops posing as a, a wizard who can foretell things that in fact he can't. And that's the analogy that works really well, I think. One of my favorite um, things to do is you look at like the yearly strategist market predictions. And it's funny because they always center around, I don't know, five to 10% returns in the S&P or even eight to 10% returns when almost never does the S&P land in the zero to 10%, right? We say right. normal market returns are extreme. It's up 20, yep. down 10, up yep, exactly. 40, you know, on and yep. on. And so um, I was actually at a forecast dinner recently in, in Mississippi and, you know, I said, look, with full knowledge that um, this prediction is going to be worthless. You still want to hear it, but, you know, it's going to be worthless. Uh, I at least am going to pick an outlier because I, I'm guessing it's not going to be, uh, you know, wherever. I, it was like price is right. Am I going to yep. bet a dollar yep. or am I going to bet, you know, two dollars and ten cents? Right, uh, right. But anyway, um, so I picked down 20. The, the bad news will be is if anyone... Uh, if we end up down 20, no one's going to invite me back because uh, I'll be the the, re the resident bear in the room. Right, right. Um, right. But uh, but anyway, so um, okay, so the challenge, you know, I, I think, um, and there's a very big real challenge in our world, particularly when we're talking with about the consumer and even, to be honest, a lot of professionals, is there's a big knowledge gap. You know, we don't teach finance or investing your money in schools. It's like 15% of high schools do. Um, and on top of that, it's complicated. It's full of jargon. And then there's the piece that you talk about, which is there's a bunch of predators out there. Some predators that are intentional predators, some that are unintentional, some that like Buffett talks about, you know, it's like, you don't ask a barber if you need a haircut type of exactly. predators, exactly. right? They're just in many ways, like uh, trying to make a living, but, yep. but the incentives are wrong. Yeah. Um, so what do we do about it? You know, like, as you're talking to these people, do you say, okay, uh, and you mentioned this in the book, do you, do you go grab an advisor? Do you uh, try the very long path of, of lifelong learning in this space? Like, what's the, um, the fork in the road si sort of um, direction that you think people uh, should or are capable of taking? So part of the challenge of that, that knowledge gap you mentioned is the vast majority of people, I would speculate, who are wondering about whether to hire someone or do it themselves, grossly overestimate the complexity and the time requirement 
for doing an excellent portfolio. And when it's, it's a, a contrast of, let's say, you know, the sort of day traders who are looking at their phone 17 times a day, I'm asked, how often should I look at my portfolio? Spend 90 minutes every three years. No, 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 that's for the dumb down verse. What's the smart money do? The smart money knows not to look at it, but every, you know, basically like a rebalancing um, approach. But, but that, that is so antithetical to making money. So the, the, the fork in the road for the DIY is the first thing you need to understand is what are you hoping to get out of an advisor? If you're paying them to beat the market or time the market, you're in trouble. You're, you're, the odds are heavily, heavily stacked against you. If you're hiring them to help you out with financial planning, I consider that a really valid use of an advisor's time or um, uh, what I would call the hand-holding part where advisors will claim that a lot of clients flip out and do silly things if left to their own devices. I think that's a valid argument for the value they provide, but do it with eyes wide open. You're, in effect, you're paying for like a, a, a therapist, a coach who's going to keep you from harming yourself. Um, there's, there's a category I call the one-off situations where people get into a decision they've got to make. I've got this uh, 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 retirement pension. How should that be worked into my portfolio and I'm getting an inheritance and how does this all work together? And that is validly uh, baffling stuff in terms of the lifelong um, education part you mentioned, but the construction and ongoing management of a portfolio for the vast majority of investors can be absurdly simple. And that's the part that really horrifies the industry. It's not I'm not saying all active is bad. I'm saying all indexed is so reliable and so solid and such a safe bet, safe, not in the risk sense, safe in the, in the um, vulnerability to have uh, really harmed yourself. It's such a prudent move. That's what horrifies the industry. Yeah, the, um, there's a quote from Bogle that goes along the lines of, you know, he's talking about his index, indexing approach and he said something like, um, you know, look, this approach works for me. Are there investment approaches that are better? Maybe he's like, but I can guarantee you there's infinite that are worse. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the, um, it has been muddled slightly, you know, I think certainly in the nineties, but, but definitely in the seventies indexing had a very clear definition and, um, that's been somewhat, um, uh, I'm not sure what the right adjective is uh, perturbed by the industry intentionally or not, where now you can have extremely low cost quantitative active strategies and extremely expensive, nonsensical index strategies. They yep. call them an index, right? Yes. Where, yep. Yep. you know, it's firms that are based in Indianapolis right. and the right. CEO wears a, a tie instead of a bow tie yes. like that theoretically could be an index and charge yep. 2%. So um but I think most people know what we're talking about when we say index is, is low cost well, but, sort of. But it is an important distinction between what is technically indexing. I make this point in the book, like you can own a single index fund for all of your equity, but if it's the, the Thai market, like Thailand stocks, you're technically indexing, but you don't have a diversified portfolio as opposed to broadly diversified, very, very broad benchmark. Like I don't, I'm not even that huge a fan of the S&P 500 just own capitalism, get, get, go really big. That's the version that's really smart. And you're right there. I don't know what the count is now. Say there are 8,000 index funds. You really need about five of those. Yeah. Well, the, I always, I, I like to tease the bogleheads on, on occasion. And, and my favorite stat is always that Vanguard technically has more active funds than index funds, you know, dollar weighted, it's way more on yep. the index, but right. that often sets them off. But, um, uh, you know, your, your point that I think um, I talk a lot about that, um, I feel like it's hard for people to really um, sit well with is this concept of, of the time you spend on the portfolio. And, you know, in every other endeavor of life, it's like the 10,000 hour rule, you want to get good at golf, like spend yep. a lot of time at golf, exactly. you want to 
make a bunch of money in stocks well yep. you need to spend time on the 10 k's and q's and yep. all this stuff but we did a post to try to um illustrate this with a chart and said okay look how much do you value your time at or so how, how much money do you make per year how much money do you spend on your portfolio and how much is this costing you so framing it a slightly different way and, and in like no scenario, what was it beneficial to spend any time on your portfolio? Because the, the amount of alpha you would theoretically even have to generate if you could was so monumental uh, that it's like you, you should be spending zero time automating it and moving on with your life. But not a lot of people do that. Some no, do, and but. that's <laughs> and that's the, the 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 argument in the book is uh, there's a, there's a section on on what's the best way to manage during various market conditions and the really boring advice is when the market's been shooting way up and you're worried it's overvalued but you don't want to miss out on further growth the best thing to do is it's it's like a, a buddhist answer sit quietly do nothing all right the market's tanking and falling out what's the best advice sit quietly do nothing and that sounds so counterintuitive doing nothing makes me wealthier yep and the same thing uh, that applies is um, so there's a, a, a behavioral bias. It's very well documented called overconfidence, which is people think we think we're much better at investing than we are when you actually measure it. And I, I uh, frame that for people in the context of humility is usually paired in people's imaginations with, with like vows of poverty, the, the, the Buddhist monk, the sisters of mercy. But actually, humility in investing makes you richer and over long periods of time, a lot richer. So very counterintuitive suggestions in the book that don't fit the way our brain is wired. And that's why I'd say good investing is simple, but it's not easy. The reason it's not easy, it's, it's a behavioral thing. That's why I often draw the, draw the food analogy where we evolved as a species to crave salty, fatty, sweet foods. In today's world, certainly in the, 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 the developed world, and even much of the uh, developing, like overabundance of food is much more the issue because our brains are wired to have rather unhealthy diets. So it's not complicated to eat less, but it's really, really hard because you're dealing with willpower and kind of fighting natural instincts and investing. It's the same way, the natural instinct, try and outsmart the market, go for your bragging rights. The data just overwhelmingly show, nope, bad call. You are much, much better off in terms of probability going with this incredibly boring, non-entertaining, uh, simple portfolio as counterintuitive as that sounds. You know, the, um, as always, like it, the most brilliant thing Wall Street's ever done is, is the fee-based model because it gets skimmed off in the background. You never see it on your statement. It just kind of yep. like little baby slice. Yep. It's like yep. the mandolin, right? We're yep. making a yep. sandwich. Yep. Um, and we always try to frame things in a slightly different way to investors and to, to really drill home the point of how much fees and, and taxes and kind of all this stuff. But, but fees is a good example um matter and we say look you know would you pay instead of paying the fee tell you what you get a second option which is you have to take a briefcase down to the asset manager once a year with ten thousand dollars in it would you do that and everyone's like hell no i wouldn't do that are you crazy yep so well, exactly. it's the same thing and in some cases yeah. even more than that and then it yeah, piles yeah. up over time and yeah so I, th I feel like i feel like you know people at least in the u.s the industry is is becoming very fee aware um, you know, if you look at the flows every year, they tend yes. to, to keep moving towards yep. index or low cost. Yes. Part of it's driven by advisors because their business is under pressure. Part of it's just individuals doing it themselves. How much um, do you think people are aware of taxes and kind of the, the alpha or the benefits there? Is that something that is still way behind the times or is that something that it's you think i would were... say way behind it's behind it's not as behind as it was even five years ago and i it, it's great you, you frame the tax question in the let, let's let's put that in the context of uh the last uh say 70 years of 
the investment industry and sort of portfolio theory. So when Markowitz comes out with quantifying risk in the very early 1950s, the reaction is kind of risk. You, you can't spend risk. Like, what are you talking about? I believe uh, Milton Friedman was on his uh, dissertation committee and even said, this isn't an economics paper, which of course by today's standard is, is sounds really silly. Then uh, fast forward, uh, certainly by the, the 1980s, even a good chunk of the 1970s, you couldn't practice investing without incorporating risk. So consumers, the world adapted, oh, risk matters. It's not a, a you don't want the, the risk tail wagging the dog. No one says that. It would sound incredibly stupid. Fast forward to 1971, when um, uh, uh, the Wells Fargo, now part of BlackRock, um, investment arm starts the first mutual fund and you would have the same fees. <laughs> I'm after returns. Why should I pay any attention to fees? Because they actually matter. And you look at the correlations. And similarly, you go to uh, tax loss harvesting really started getting traction in the late 1990s. We, we started in 99. Uh, we were not the first player. And watching that over the last 23 years, the awareness is growing. There's still a long way to go, but I would put it very much in the context of what used to be this, well, you wouldn't want the tax tail wagging the dog. Basically, anyone saying that is in effect telling you, I don't really understand taxes or care about them because the whole focus, and this is what I learned at an oil company, run all your numbers based on a risk adjusted after tax return number. That. That's not that hard a concept, but totally it's, logical. Still, it's still taking time. So to answer your question, we're early in that, but I'm watching what's happening in the industry. I'm watching how many firms are focusing on it, and it is shifting. The interesting part, though, is the tax efficiency is so uh, negatively correlated with, with fees. The cheapest, most boring stuff like indexing is is highly efficient on the tax side. The, the really awful stuff from a tax perspective would be uh, for the ultra high net worth, like hedge funds are notoriously um, uh, tax inefficient, kick out a lot of short-term gains, but active management for stock picking uh, is just, is, is bad enough to try and uh, uh, defend in a, in a pre-tax world. Uh, Morningstar ran a great piece uh, published about five, six years ago. It was a 10-year holding period through the end of 2015. And they looked after tax, not against the benchmark, against, they just picked one sort of, uh, you know, a, 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 a fund, I think it was a stock only fund. And they found that 95, that's right, 95% of the active funds failed to outperform when you included the taxes. And it was just this Hey, any gambler would understand this. I think it was, you had a 5% chance of winning 71 basis points. Let's say you're, you're making a bet. Okay, I'll give you a 5% chance, Meb, to win $71 or a 95% chance to lose 124, I think it was, something like that. Wait, wait, wait. I have a 95% chance of losing 120 or a 5% chance of winning 70? Like, that's a stupid bet. No one, oh, Millions of people and trillions of dollars are making that bet in spite of the, the overwhelming evidence that once you throw in the tax piece, it what became a tough sell should become close to impossible. Why do they hold out hope? What's the... Be, uh, be, because uh, a number of things. One, the tax piece is still got another decade or two to really be broadly understood. Two because of that correlation with the fees, the industry is actually, in, depending on how focused they are and active, very wary of investors waking up to after-tax returns. I, I um, was with the uh, uh, chief investment officer of a, a client who was in our office several years ago, um, and they were talking about their hedge fund strategies, and they just acknowledged, we can't have our clients understanding the tax implications of our hedge fund strategies because they'd look awful. And they were at least acknowledging we can't discuss this. So the industry as a whole has a very strong incentive for people not to really um, 
be aware of that extra tax drag, but consumer preferences are starting to pull that tax awareness and even the less efficient firms are starting to shift on that. They still are wary of saying things like, you wanna look at after tax returns, indexing looks even better. So it's gonna take some time, but um, I, you know, in my wildest dreams, this book would be one of the catalysts to help people wake up to this idea of focus on the stuff you can control. What can you control? Number one, fees. Number two, taxes. That's the easiest to control. And the obvious implication of that for anybody in the industry, on, especially on the marketing side, is, Patrick, you're picking the two most boring, off-putting parts of investing. Taxes and fees? Nobody wants to talk about that. No, but it's the part you can actually control. And that's where I throw in the, uh, the, the serenity prayer that they use in 12-step uh, process. Grant me to the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That would be market returns, which, which, uh, which strategies are gonna outperform. Uh, the courage to change the things I can, that would be stuff like fees and taxes. And the hardest part, the wisdom to tell the difference. We, uh, we wrote a paper. Uh, we made the mistake of writing a paper on taxes <laughs> that uh, was probably our least read paper. I think it was like really fascinating and it'd probably be only two people in the world, you and I, that they would uh, really enjoy it. But it kind of walks through, you know, if you're in a high tax bracket, particularly where I live and you live, yep. um, you really don't want these high dividend yielding stocks. And so we kind of walk through, actually, if you had a value approach that avoided the yielding stocks, uh, how that performed in various scenarios. And um even with more rebouncing because of the ETF structure, it leads you to some interesting conclusions, um, but not something like talk about the least marketable idea of all time, Patrick, is like the, the no yield or low yield fund. Come, in, come on, man, nobody wants that. So uh, I, uh, I can sympathize on, uh, on kind of how, how the esoteric of, of taxes can get, um, can get a little messy. However, some of our best episodes have been tax related. So you never know, uh, this, this may hit a funny bone with some of our, uh, some of our listeners. Yeah. It's, it's just about the realization that, and this is the industry does resist that you've got pre-tax returns and after-tax returns. And if you ask someone, okay, we're analyzing the returns for a, a traditional pension plan, a defined benefit pension plan. Should we use the after-tax return numbers? No, that's stupid. They're irrelevant. Like they, they are not just less valuable. They're absolutely irrelevant. Ah, okay. For taxable investors. Well, for them, the pre-tax returns are equally irrelevant. That's not reality. That's not what they're keeping. The only number that matters is their after-tax return. That's going to take a while for people to click on the fact that it's not an extra piece to pay attention to after tax returns for taxable accounts are the only ones that that count and that's going to take a while for the industry to, to pay attention to well you had a quote from the book where you were talking about um survey of investors like in 401k and it was almost 40 yep. percent thought they didn't pay any fees and another yep. 20 some percent was unsure yeah <laughs> and so you're already like almost two-thirds of people either yep. thought they paid none or some and so part yep. of the industry likes to keep it, you know, the less they bring it up, the better. Um, right. And in particularly with it, like, you know, it's funny, I spend a lot of time debating and we all do on uh, Twitter and just investment research conferences or whatever. It's like the final five, five or 10% of the of football field or the debate, you know, because the first 80%, 90% seems so obvious. And so often it's like, look, these things over here are probably all fine. But these things over here are so atrociously terrible that that's like where the you know debate should be. So I look at a lot of these mutual funds every year to, to do these just enormous capital gains distributions, yep. and and I just I just you know palm to to my face. I'm like, yep. oh my god, how can anyone still be here? And I think yeah. I'm just waiting for that world to die or get divorced or something because um, it like. It's astonishing. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, well, it's, it's the, the behavioral 
research on that is it, it's, it's called mental accounting where you compartmentalize. I pay my taxes from my checking account, my investment accounts, that's kind of separate. That separation is, is the problem. And, and we, we published a paper uh, about, five, about six years ago called uh, What Would Yale Do If It Were Taxable? That hammered that point home that showed through the research. And we just picked Yale as this very famous, justifiably admired um, uh, portfolio run by the uh, late David Svensson at the time. Um, and the point of the paper was this tax thing is not a little tweak you add at the end. You have to analyze all your cash flows, all your risk on an after tax basis. And it doesn't just mean slight modification. It can completely eliminate entire asset classes and make others look, look better. So that is going to take a while for the tax piece to shift from this interesting add on to real investing and instead be. Uh, categorized as there are two types of investing and two types of investors, those who pay taxes and those who are exempt. And you have to run all the numbers differently for those two, those two worlds. And that's going to take a while to evolve. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's people think of taxes like twice, once in December, once, you know, April or whenever they're thinking yep. about it. And yep. it's like a scramble both times. It's never yep. exactly. It, when it should really be kind of the the fundamental underpinning, um, but uh, but at least kudos to Morningstar and others for bringing that to light on some of the published pages. I saw they started yeah. doing some security lending revenue. There's yep. always more data. It's pretty yep. pretty good to see. Yep. Um, all right. What what else in the book have we not talked about? Some on the on the behavioral side. The learning is around like people have trouble dieting. How do I get my arms around the fact that my brain is wired for me to do unhealthy things? That's a, that's a hard message to sell. And, and so, uh, and a little, um, a little dour. I, the, the, the joke at my firm has been that if, if I were in charge of, of uh, marketing for a sushi restaurant, I'd go around asking people, hey, Matt, you want some cold dead fish? Like it just, mm -hmm. I want the truth to be out there. And, and it's really unpleasant to realize it's not just the industry. I, I do criticize the industry, but you got to look in the mirror too. In fact, I heard a, a great uh, comment from a behavioral finance professor at uh, Columbia at a conference once. And he said, when people, and this is years ago, when people find out, I, I study behavioral finance, they get fascinated. That's great teach me the tips for how to make a killing in the market based on everyone else's biases. <laughs> Shake his head and say, no, it's about the mirror and learning your own, your own biases. And that's, that's not sexy. That's hard discipline work, but that's the, the, I think um, one of the more hidden points of the book is your, your behavior drives your investment returns a lot more than your, uh, you know, your neocortex driven cerebral research. And I say that as, you know, about as geeky a quant as they come, like that, that's my world, that, that quantitative analytic side of investing and to realize, you know, the behavioral folks, they're not just blowing smoke because it's a very real part of investing. And yet, it's not as much fun because it's about controlling your own behavior rather than, than figuring out how to make a killing. In fact, one of the things you need to surrender is this longing to make a killing. And I, I suspect it's even tied to a kind of competitive nature. Part of the research I have in the book is the, on the gender side. Men are slightly worse investors than women across really broad numbers. This is, Vanguard's found this. There've been other research, there was a great article called Boys Will Be Boys. Fidelity just published something on this. So it's fairly consistent. Why are women slightly better? They're not smarter. They're not good at prognosticating. Women are awful at making financial predictions. Men are also awful, but unlike women, we think we're good at, or more so than women, we think we're good at it. And so 
the, the question can come down to, let's say you're in a room full of 100 people, uh, all investors. What's, the, what's your utility fund? What's the, your, your end game? What's your goal? And if a lot of people are saying, well, I want the highest probability of the best portfolio in my retirement or that I leave to my heirs, then indexing is overwhelming slam dunk smart bet. It doesn't mean active won't ever work. It just means the odds are heavily, heavily stacked, especially over long periods. If your goal is to have bragging rights in five years or one year with the, 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 you know, your, your, your colleagues at the gym, then active is the only way to go. You're never going to be number one out of 100 with indexing. You'll, you'll typically come in pre-tax around 85th, 90th percentile. So that competitive angle uh, really intrigues me. I haven't seen any research on that, as that may be part of the, the overconfidence side is the, the benefit to the ego, basically, of getting to brag about your investment outcome and your, your, your clever maneuvers. Whereas if you're indexing, you're dead in the water. Like, sorry, you're not going to be at some garden party bragging about your index portfolio. That is dull, drab, unexciting. People are not going to be impressed, but you're going to have more money. Yeah. The um, something about this concept of average feels very, you know, un American. Yeah. Uh, yep. You know, that where all these risk takers um, yep. want to believe the dream is possible. There's a good Charlie Munger quote. Um, that we have uh, used over the years. And he says, um, he goes, I know one guy, he's extremely smart and a very capable investor. I asked him, what returns do you tell your institutional clients you'll earn for them? And he said, 20%. I couldn't believe it because he knows that's impossible. But he said, Charlie, if I gave them a lower number, they wouldn't give me any money to invest. The investment management industry is insane. So I think he's spot on though. Like the, um, we heard an active manager the other day predict that their portfolio uh, was going to do 50% a year for the next five years. Whoa. And um, <laughs> I said, huh, that's interesting. And I, so I looked up the French trauma data back to 1920s. I was like, what time has the industry ever even returned 50% for five years? And it was, you know, obviously well to the right of the decimal point. I yep. think it was 0.1 or 0.01% of the time. It happened like yep. three times. It was like coal yeah. or something. So I said, well, you, you compound at 50%, you very quickly become Bill Gates. Doesn't take that yep. long. Um, but people want to believe, you know, that it's possible. Right. And that's, and that's, uh, that's part of the challenge is, is, so my book is a combination of data and, you know, guidance and a kind of description of a rewiring. And that's, that's hard stuff. One of the comments I make in the book is self-help books tend to make really hard things sound easy. Oh, you want to have whatever it is, your, your love life better, your financial situation, you want to lose weight, you want to exercise more. All you got to do is follow these simple steps. Yeah, the steps may not be that complicated to explain, but the discipline of changing your behavior, I may be projecting here, it's really hard for me to change my bad habits. I don't like it. I don't like behaving like a grown up, <laughs> and none of us do. And so the the a lot of the message of the book is, is the weird irony of doing nothing earns you so much more. And back to your point about um, average sounds un-American, the, the hard part to, for some to understand is when you go with indexing, you're not settling for average, you're settling for like 85th or 90th percentile. And yeah, you are giving up that 10% chance of, of knocking out home runs in exchange for being better than, than 85 or 90 percent? Like, who wouldn't, wouldn't take yeah. those odds? So well, it's, it's not average. It's actually really, really good. It's just not the absolute best. I, I was talking, I need to get one of these for my podcast studios, the, the advertisement back in the day where uh, aimed at Vanguard, where they said indexing is un-American. So I need to get oh, one of those. Oh, uh, it's uh, that the, the Lutold group did. Yeah. 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 So, um, but you know, like, so one solution is certainly to try to build systems that keep us from ourselves. You know, you mentioned kind of the chocolate broccoli. And so yep. when I go to the grocery store, I try really hard to only buy 
you know, healthy food yep. with the knowledge that I go out to eat a fair amount and yep. will misbehave then probably. Yep. But, um, but, you know, if I have uh, some delicious ice cream in the freezer, like I'll probably eat it. Yep. Um, and so same thing with the portfolio. Um, the challenge of course is um, there's a lot that's marketed as, you know, um, disruption in your best interest. I'm looking at you, Robin Hood. Um, but the reality <laughs> at like every turn, they're pushing you, nudging you in the wrong direction because yep. it benefits them. And so right. trying to align yourself with the right fiduciaries, um, you know, I think, I think we could certainly do more in our industry and in legislation to try to protect and help that. Um, what are your ideas there? You get a, I give Patrick the magic wand Sure. Gets to, uh... So I, I would not actually, I, I'm sure there are some um, legal or legislative solutions like disclosure, but that's a, I think the industry is going to change from consumer behavior. And you, you framed it as we need to put in place some, what would you call it, processes? I think it's a combination of, of um, it's, in effect, it's like self-imposed constraints which are unpleasant, but they're not as bad because they're self-imposed. And maybe even um, uh, some social support for that. I've, I've been fascinated. There are weight loss um, uh, firms that emphasize like a group support role where like people around you are keeping you more on the straight and narrow. The same back to the 12 step, same thing. If, if you're whatever, alcoholic, drug addict, having a sponsor, you call when you're 10. It's like you need that. As an investor, I'm tempted by this. I got to make a killing in the market. Um, I better call my sponsor and, and have them talk me down off the ledge. The other angle that I've, I've heard only very recently, I've read some on this and had a, 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 a friend who's very senior at uh, actually runs an advisory firm describe it as back to the chocolate cake and broccoli which i use in the book um investors will have worse performance if you force them to eat only broccoli meaning you don't give them any fun and i was fascinated this idea the the concept of it the optimal portfolio for most people would be to have a little five ten percent play area where you go nuts you do all kind of active stuff you day trade you put your active funds and you put 95 percent, 90 percent in grown-up lockdown portfolio so you get the satisfaction and the bragging rights and in effect saying you're more likely to stay on your diet when you can misbehave a little rather than being so rigid and sort of Calvinist, you must follow your you know, self-imposed or externally imposed rules. We don't like doing that as humans. <laughs> that, makes, that makes me prickly. I'm sure it makes everyone prickly. So I think the interesting opportunities there are, are kind of following up on what um, Nobel laureate uh, Richard Thaler talks about in uh, Nudge. Like, nudge people into healthier behaviors and build in like group support or other tools to help offset those inclinations. The problem is you have an industry like the, you know, like junk food that makes money when people eat stuff that's not unhealthy to ever eat it. But if it's all you eat, that's not great for your longevity. So I, that's, I, that's why I view it as very similar to dieting and this kind of um, self-imposed constraints or other structures you put in to, you know, basically bring out the best in, in all of us. Um, but that sounds a little kind of woo-woo, new agey, but I actually think that's where the investment, uh, uh, the smartest investment um, uh, messaging for, for, for the public, for investors, that's where it's heading. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of innovative um, ideas with product design, you know, as I see some of these um, new platforms emerge. An example um, I give uh, from years ago was Betterment. You know, they had introduced a little feature that when someone was trying to change their 
um, you know, portfolio or risk score, they would pop up a box and say, hey, just so you know, this is going to be taxable. It's going to cost you. And they put a number like $150 nice. or nice. And they said a lot of people didn't abandon it, you know, and so um, just those little things that we yep, can design yep. in, yeah. Uh, as opposed to being like, here's some confetti, go trade some options, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Um, yep. But but eventually, you know, it, it sort of self selects because um, the people that end up in the casino end up losing all their money. So that's, <laughs> those, those those platforms that rely on churn and destroying your consumers right. um, usually right. don't last, and, as the right. that's forex b- brokers can attest. Uh, yeah. Um, one other thing investors can do that I've, I've um, I, I'm developing a, a, a digital training course version of the book. And one of the components is write a letter to yourself that you're supposed to read during a meltdown. So it's like, I don't like being scolded or lectured by anyone. What about you? What if you wrote uh, basically the premise of right now, the market is not in complete meltdown. So you can write it rationally. And, and in effect, say, it's almost like having compassion for that future you. You're in the middle of thinking capitalism is over, your retirement is done, and that's a very real fear. But remember when you put this bet down that this was part of the game. This, like, if you're in stocks, you should not ever be saying, how could this happen? How could the market go down 50%? That means you didn't understand the stock market. And I, thought we you were gonna say, I thought you say it was going to hook you up to some like electrodes and shock you. Every time you tried to <laughs> hey, place a um, trade. who knows? Maybe, maybe we, got, we got a sci-fi movie. Uh, yeah. From, or uh, like uh, um, clockwork orange with the eye, you know, basically uh, 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 rewiring the brain again. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very hard to counter these ingrained evolutionary traits. Well, I think, um, um, one of your, uh, you know, Morningstar current, uh, I don't know if you ever worked with her, Christine Benz, but she talks oh, yeah. a lot about having a written plan. And we often yeah. will like do polls on Twitter and say, do you have yep. a written investing plan? Yep. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could be three yep. bullet points, yep. 60, 40 rebounds once a year, whatever. Yeah. Um, it could be 10 pages, but do you have one? And obviously the vast majority of investors don't. And so yep. the problem with that, of course, is that when things happen, whether it's pandemic, war, what a recession, you know, whatever the emotions creep in. And it's all, yep. I mean, it feels like it's almost always the, the wrong emotion. You know, it's like yeah. the, yeah, but, but they're the very natural. The greed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. very natural that we have those emotions. What I, what I try and frame that is, is befriend those emotions. You, you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to subjugate them. They're part of who you are. They're part of how we make decisions. It's not as though emotions get in the way of the brain making decisions. That's a ridiculous concept. The brain makes decisions from all of its parts. It's it's rational and it's it's highly emotional. And you got to blend all that stuff in. The trick, I think, is bracing yourself in advance. You want that high return? You are going to pay through suffering and pain. And I, the, the, the pushback is you want to go with a, a, a super high uh, uh, stock allocation. For example, let's say it's just two, two asset classes, stocks and bonds. You want to go with 100% stocks. Mathematically, that's the best for a 20-year return. If you're going to sign up for this, you better have a high pain threshold. It's going to be awful. You probably, If you haven't invested a lot before, you have no idea. The, the whole risk tolerance questionnaire thing, I think can be a little misleading. The real telling evidence is to ask someone of a certain age, obviously if you're 20 today, this is a silly question. Did you own stocks through the 0809 meltdown and you never sold? Okay, you passed the test because by your actions, you've proven you've got the metal to ride through. You don't ask people, how bad did you feel? We all felt horrible. It was icky. It was a disturbing thing. Even if you study risk and know this stuff as well as some of us do, it, it doesn't help your emotions freak out. But knowing that in advance, it's, it's baked into stock market investing. That's the um, message which also requires getting rid of that crystal ball and in the industry to a lesser extent than active security selection on the active asset allocation. The industry is terrible at predicting when 
the stock market's going to be up or down. You need to take this very long-term view of stocks historically have returned a lot more than bonds. Of course, no guarantee there, but that is a, a, a crystal ball prognostication I would recommend. But the go into it with open eyes of of not, you're not going to be a little perturbed. You are going to be miserable and you need to understand that. But that's a kind of a dark message. It's like telling everyone, you know, someday you're going to die. Well, yeah, I learned that in biology class, but I don't want to think about it. <laughs> and it's kind of the I same like, thing with stocks. I like the idea, listeners, we got some developers out there, come build this for me. I want a brokerage that you put in a buy order. And it's like, all right, how long are you going to hold this? <laughs> and, you know, you say, look, no, I have a long-term perspective, this fund or this ETF or stock. And so yeah. you're going to put in 10 years and it's going to say, okay, we're going to charge you a fee. There's no fees, but we're going to charge you a fee if you uh, liquidate early. And maybe it's like a sliding scale. <sighs> um, but then I like the idea that that fee doesn't, so that, that's the penalty, but the benefit is that fee doesn't necessarily just go to the management company it would get recycled to the people that are holding like there, there's a way to get like yeah, the, yeah. the benefit too if like you're a good yeah. behavior you yeah. get a dividend or um, or you could even have it that that investor if they go five years and they really do hold it then that then the penalty goes away but it's, it's right. like a self-imposed version of some of the the particularly gross stuff you might see with like variable annuities where they, right, they right. make in these absurd surrender fees. Some of them run as long as 10 years. So there's a, there's a fun idea there and I don't know if it would ever scale, but um, it'd be fun to at least try. Um, all right. So the book listeners um, out in the stores, pick up a copy. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a dose of uh, good humor, good advice, but also take your medicine too. Um <laughs> What else, uh, as you look out to the horizon, what's on your brain? Anything else you're thinking about or is it totally depleted from this writing? Are you scratching your head about some other ideas? It, it's pretty depleted. My, the actual, the original book idea I had that I went to this editor with was uh, a broader topic called, what if you just told the truth? Ooh. And, and it, <laughs> yes, your reaction, very telling. That's too honest. Yeah, um, with a combination of the investment industry as a sort of, little example, a little microcosm of a lot of non-truth telling going on, then looking at organizations and, and power, like what if you told the truth within an organization? Obviously, organizations are built to promote uh, sort of self-indulgence. And, and what it really comes to is if you have a lot of authority, um, don't assume telling the truth is going to be bad for you because it can actually lead to uh, a healthy company culture and, and, and healthy uh, financial rewards, and then kind of tie it into what if you just told the truth inside your own head? And the, my uh, editor heard that idea and she said, well, you're the client. So if that's the book you want to write, we can do that. Um, I'll throw my two cents in. Like, uh, no one's going to buy it. Why not? It's all over the map. It makes no sense. Write the investment book first. And if you want to do that other one, you can do it later. All right, uh, version right, so 2.0. I'm follow, excited. Follow her advice. I, I don't know if there's another book in me, but that, that's what it would be about, about the, the truth. And you can certainly see it with, um, you know, uh, political propaganda today, especially coming out of Moscow. Like, yeah, not a lot of truth telling going on there. Yeah. And that's that's the way of the world. But also the truth, I think, is very aligned with sort of honorable ethical behavior. When you look back on your career, uh, what's been your most memorable investment? Good, bad, in between, uh, anything that just comes uh, to the frontal lobe? Uh, well, the financial benefit I gained from never selling any of a perio, but that came because I wanted to control the messaging. I, I, my basic rule was I want to work in the investment industry, but I want to have to lie well, you're going to have to start your own firm for the most part. My friend, that was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Where's the best place people go? Uh, they want to keep an um, update with what you're doing, writing about these days uh, after they buy the book. How do they get yep. in touch with you? Can they? Sure. So my website, which is patrickgettis.co, um, has information on the book. It's got some free tools. There's a, a chapter on the book you can download. Um, there are a bunch of videos there that are trying to counter the problem that 
investing for many people is both both tedious and intimidating. So these videos are are a lot of mocking of the industry, but some uh, real value. Um, and you can also sign up to uh, my uh, my email list and get notifications. As I mentioned, there'll be some uh, uh, digital training coming out. So that's the best place to find out more about the book and everything I've been talking about. Awesome. Patrick, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure, sir.